Hello and welcome to Morningstar's 2014 Individual Investor Conference. I'm Jason Stipp, site editor for Morningstar.com. If you've attended our conferences in the past, welcome back. If you're a first time attendee, we're glad that you're spending some time with us today. I promise you it will be time well spent. Without further ado, and no breaks for right now, we're moving into our first panel, the big picture. So if you thought the weather was hard enough to get through, imagine what the economy is facing right now. We have, of course, the weather issues. We have Fed fretting about uh, removal of the stimulus that the Fed has enacted over the last several years. The housing market, which was supposed to be the big driver of the recovery, seeing some slowing growth there. And emerging markets, of course, which had so much promise coming out of the 2008 downturn, haven't performed perhaps as well as investors might have expected. So what should we take of all this data, this conflicting data, the revisions to data? How can we make sense of it? I'm joined today happily by three expert panelists who will be able to help us put all of this big picture economic data into perspective. First up, uh, we have Heidi Richardson. Uh, Heidi's from BlackRock. Uh, she joined BlackRock in 2010 with 23 years of experience in active investment management. As a global investment strategist for BlackRock, she can offer perspective on all the asset classes, equities, fixed income, alternatives, and multi-sector approaches. And of course, she's plugged into the uh, BlackRock investment strategies team, uh, research and investment views. Uh, Heidi, thanks so much for joining us thanks today. Thanks for having me, Jason. Uh, next to Heidi is Randy Krosner. Uh, Randy is the Norman Bobbins Professor of Economics at the University of Chicago's Booth School of Business. Uh, from 2006 to 2009, Randy served as a governor of the U.S. Federal Reserve. He chaired the, Fed's committee, the Fed Committee's uh, Supervision and Regula Regulation and the Committee on the Consumer and Community Affairs. Uh, he is uh, taking a leading, he, during that he was taking a leading role in developing responses to uh, the financial crisis, so a lot of insights on the Fed's activities. Uh, from 2001 to 2003, he was a member of the President's Council of Economic Advisors. Randy, thanks so much for being here. Great. I'm really happy to be here. And next to Randy is uh, my colleague and friend Bob Johnson. Uh, Bob's Morningstar's Director of Economic Analysis. Uh, he's um, also a Morningstar.com columnist, and he has more than 20 years of investment industry experience, including both buy-side and sell-side assignments as a research analyst. Uh, prior to assuming his current role in 2008, uh, Bob was an Associate Director of Equity Analysis for the technology team at Morningstar. Okay, so we have a lot to cover today. Uh, let's get going. I think there's, as I mentioned, not a short list of issues the economy is facing right now. But let's kind of start off, and I want to get uh, from each of you a picture of uh, your take on the overall U.S. economy. So the recent data has been mixed. We've seen revisions to data. Uh, it's been volatile. It's kind of been difficult to read, and I think it's leaving a lot of questions about where are we right now? What is the overall health of the U.S. economy? Heidi, I'd like to start with you, your overview take on what is the situation? Sure. Well, I think we're in the middle of a globalized, synchronized expansion, not only in the U.S., but outside of the U.S. If we look at the U.S., we've come off of multiple years of this 2 percent economic growth. And this year we're forecasting about 2.75, 250, 2.75 in terms of the economic growth. The one concern is the consumer, obviously, in terms of I think the biggest issue that we're looking at with the implications of, of the growing economy is wage growth. And we haven't seen wage growth for the consumer. So if we look over the last few years, we've barely outpaced inflation. And so the implications of that, one of the numbers we're watching very, very closely are the employment numbers. Um, not only just pure unemployment number, because a lot of the decline in that is coming from the participation rate following off. Um, but we're looking at really wage creation, uh, looking at job creation and seeing the implications for the consumer there. If, but if we look at corporate balance sheets, corporate balance sheets are, are very strong. There's record level cash on the balance sheets. Um, we're seeing a pickup in the M&A activity. We're seeing a pickup in, um, in share buybacks. We're seeing a pickup in, in increasing dividends for corporations. So the end result for consumers, I think, from an equity standpoint, is still a positive moving forward. And Randy, she mentioned some good things and some bad things, some concerns and some bright spots. But we've seen it's all it seems to be adding up to kind of slow growth for the U.S. economy. And it's been that way for a while, but with a lot of volatility. Yep. So how would you characterize the current state where we are today? I think where we've been for the last couple of years, I, I call a sideways slide. We've been growing around 2 percent, sometimes a bit above, sometimes a bit of below, below, but not really getting breakout growth that we need to kind of get back to uh, to where we were. There's a chance that we can do a little bit better this year for many of the reasons that, uh, that Heidi had mentioned. If you look at corporate balance sheets, they, in principle, are ready to invest. Very, very strong balance sheets, reasonable profit growth, but there's still a lot of headwinds that are out there. We've uh, addressed some of the fiscal uncertainty that we had. We had these fiscal follies in Washington where you know, we were shooting ourselves in the foot for no particular reason. That's not really helpful in a, in a difficult uh, economic recovery. 
We've uh, addressed some of those. The clouds are not completely gone, but that's, uh, that's helpful. We have a lot of regulatory uncertainties. I'm glad that one of the later sessions is going to focus on health care, because I, I know in my travels around and talking with a lot of people in the corporate sector, that's a big uncertainty, both for larger firms as well as for the small and medium-sized uh, size firms. So there's still these headwinds that are there, but the basic structure should allow us to go forward. Corporate balance sheets as well as household balance sheets have improved significantly from, from five years ago. But um, we really need to turn the corner on confidence. We could be there, but I'm not quite sure we're going to break out of this sideways slide yet. Bob, you've been following the economy and the recovery, and a lot of what you've been writing is we're seeing more of the same, we're seeing more of the same, despite the fact that on any short-term data, it looks volatile. It looks like right. we're having one quarter of, hey, things are turning around, and another quarter of, hey, things are falling off a cliff. So where are we really when you look past some of that short-term noise? Sure, and the noise has been extensive. I mean, we've had one quarter as low as one-tenth of a percent growth in this recovery, and one as high as 4.1%. So we've been what would appear to be all over the map if we take one quarter and multiply by four and annualize it. But if you look at the year-over-year -year numbers, they're a little bit less volatile. And then if you really look at the fundamentals of the economy, it indicates that maybe it's more of a statistical problem than reality, that the volatility really hasn't been there. It's been a much more steady state economy than we all thought. Uh, you look at employment growth, and since 2011, we've grown employment about 2% year-over-year on the private sector every year and every month, practically, when you look at it on an average basis. Well, we see the numbers, oh, it's 50,000, oh, it's 250,000. Well, you know, that's statistical noise from month to month. Uh, there's margins of error in there that are huge. But you really look at the numbers, we're three years straight of, of very, very stable employment growth and also very, very uh, stable consumption growth, which would follow. If you've got stable income growth uh, as uh, given by wages, you would expect consumption to be relatively stable. And sure enough, it has. So I'm not a big buyer of all this volatility and a lot of its statistical measurement issues and not the reality of the economy. When you step back and look and pass some of the noise, you do sort of see perhaps steady growth, but not inspiring growth. So why didn't we see the kind of rocket ship recovery coming out of 2008 that we might have seen in, in past recessions. Heidi, what are your thoughts on why the growth has been kind of slow? Well, I think it's a number of things. One is if you just look at the demographics of the U.S. population and the aging of the population, not only in the U.S., but post-World War II developed economies in Europe and Japan as well, you're into a period where people are entering the retirement phase. Um, they're taking money out of the system as opposed to putting money into the system. I think corporations, because of all this uncertainty with Washington, what's my tax rate, what's it going to cost me in health care benefits, you know, they didn't want to spend. So they weren't increasing wages and salaries for their employees. They weren't thinking about investing in CapEx spending. And we're starting to see a pickup of that now, I think, which will help lead to this this over 2% economic growth, certainly not robust. We're not looking at the threes and fours in the short period of time. But um, I think people were just on the fence in terms of really spending because they, they weren't sure what it was going to cost them in terms of insuring their employees and those types of things and the taxation that they were going to be facing, uh, particularly with the sequestering. And Heidi mentioned some demographic shifts, Randy, that we're going to be facing. And I think the, one of the questions in investors' minds is we saw the growth rates, uh, normalized growth rates in the past. And people are worried that we're not going to be able to meet those growth rates going forward, that normalized rates will be slower in, in the U.S., in kind of a slowdown that we've seen in other parts of the developed uh, world economy. What's your take? Should we expect slower GDP growth going forward than maybe we saw over the last 20 years? Well, there has been a demographic shift. And ultimately, economic growth is the number of hours worked in the economy times the output per hour, that is productivity. And so let's for the moment assume that productivity hasn't really changed that much. But uh, exactly as Heidi said, we're having um, um, a demographic shift. We're having more older people in the, uh, uh, in the workforce. Now, interestingly, we thought we'd get much less labor force participation from older workers. That hasn't been as much of the case, but we've been seeing uh, lower labor force participation basically across the whole spectrum. A little bit, uh, little bit less than we expected at the uh, older workers, but a lot less for, for younger workers. There seems to be a sort of a broader discouragement that's out there. We have a low, um, low employment to population ratio. And so what that means is that even if we have the same productivity growth, we're going to have uh, slower economic growth because there just aren't as many labor hours being uh, offered in the economy. And Bob, we had a, a reader ask, um, th they say, I have a 25-year time horizon, so why do they care about the economy today? Well, I would say if we do expect to see uh, slower economic growth over the longer term, that could potentially have an impact on how you would think about the markets that you're investing in. But my question is kind of similar to the readers, but maybe a, a take on it is, 
Is it uh, such a terrible thing that growth is a little bit slower? Is slow growth really bad, or can we have a slow, sustainable growth where people can still do okay? Yeah. Well, I think you almost have to answer that on two levels. I mean, one thing on a personal level, obviously, if you've got a slower population growth and you've got a slower uh, GDP growth, that's fine. The per capita number turns out to be still pretty much the same. You might even be able to improve it because you're more efficient uh, when you're not growing in these cycles where you got 10%, well, never that much, but 6% GDP growth, and then you go to a, you know, a big recession, you go up and down, and maybe if we've got slower growth, we're not quite as volatile. So that's one uh, positive of the slower growth. And certainly, uh, you aren't racing around trying to find things quite the way that you are um, in that environment. So I think that's certainly a positive. Uh, on, it's not as good news uh, for corporations, where the individual depends on the per capita number. Corporations depend on, well, what's going on in the overall economy. So if the economy is growing 2% instead of 4%, that's a big deal to a corporation. And it, it can't be offset by a, a lower population like it can on the income front. So I think it's probably okay to good news for the individual, probably bad news to corporations that are gonna face issues like labor shortages and, and uh, older consumers that are gonna wanna spend less and it's gonna be harder to target those customers. So I think probably good news for the individual, probably not so good news for corporations. Heidi, we have another reader question, and I think this is a good one that people often conflate these two. Uh, the reader asks uh, Richard, he says, are we gonna have a better uh, economy and potentially a worse stock market? He's basi basically saying the economy and the stock market aren't the same thing, mm -hmm. and we can see an economy doing really well and growing really fast, but the stocks aren't performing very well. We're gonna talk about emerging markets in a little bit. That's one area where it's pretty apparent. Um, but how can people think about what's the connection, if any, between the e expectations for economic growth and what you'll see the stock market do? You know, I, I don't see a high degree of correlation there, right? I mean, there's some drivers, obviously, with the growth of the economy and consumer spending and the emergence of middle class in these regions, but the emerging markets are a great example. If you look at the emerging markets compared to the developed markets, they're growing at 2x, sometimes 3x in terms of um, the regions and the environments, yet we're not seeing the capital flow into these emerging markets because of some of the geopolitical uncertainty. Um, emerging markets, as you mentioned, is a great example of looking at that. If we look at an average growth of emerging markets coming in at 5% in the U.S. marketplace in developed Europe coming in at developed Europe and Japan coming in at less than 1% economic growth, U.S. coming in at sort of 25 or so, and then these emerging markets at 4, 5, and 6 in particular regions. If the capital flow isn't going there and the money flow is not going into, into those regions, we're not going to see a big expansion in those markets um, from a, a return standpoint. If we look at the U.S. marketplace, although we're in this ex expansionary mode coming off of this sort of great idol of two percent economic growth. Last year, I, I would admit we were surprised with a 30 percent return in the U.S. marketplace. We were not anticipating. This this year, in terms of our forecast, we're anticipating mid to high single digit economic growth in the U.S. marketplace. So we're looking at stock market returns coming in at six to eight percent, more more in line with the earnings growth of the corporations within the S&P 500 as, a, as an index. So there's not, a, there's not a high degree of a correlation. I mean, generally, if we're seeing these periods of growth, we're seeing the again the emergence of the middle class, the consumer spending, uh, driving to that. But in the U.S. marketplace, I think looking at economic growth coming in, uh, we are seeing the consumers slowing down. Um, and we we're looking at some of these consumer stocks. We're underweight consumer stocks right now because of the issue with the unemployment level, the wage growth level. And if we look at consumer discretionary right now, it's trading at 21 times, you know, compared to the broad market of 16, 17 times in the S&P. So we think it's just it's it's an expensive area of the marketplace and we're not seeing that consumer we see, we're seeing the consumer in the mid market being squeezed so I'm um, not a direct correlation I'm glad you mentioned the consumer because obviously 70 percent of the US economy the consumer is going to be the big driver there so Randy what's your take on the health of the consumer part of the economy and the trends that that we've been seeing with the consumer I do think we're seeing consumer spending uh, perhaps be a bit disappointing and especially in recent times and uh, so we certainly have come back a lot from where we were because uh, the consumer and well, the entire economy, but particularly the household se sector, was very highly levered. Uh, that has come down. That's been painful for, uh, for people who have taken losses on their homes. Uh, but that is stabilizing in almost all parts of the uh, country. And over the last year, the housing market came back. Looks like it's not likely to have the same sort of robust recovery this year as it had uh, before, but there's no particular reason to see it fall off. This is very important both for people's wealth and confidence, because for most households, a lot of their savings, if not almost all of their savings, comes through their, um, their home. And um, if uh, they have more housing wealth, they're more willing to spend. Uh, also, it just broadly gives people more, more confidence. So I think 
that's going to be helpful going forward. But with lower employment to, uh, to, uh, to population ratio, lower labor force participation, we're just not seeing the same kind of income growth for the, uh, uh, for the economy as a whole. And exactly as John had said, that will, might put a little bit of pressure on, uh, on corporations. But broadly, I, I think we can move ahead this year a little bit more than we have other years. So I'm broadly in, uh, in line with, uh, with Heidi's forecast for a somewhat stronger growth to tr break out of the sideways slide. But we keep having some sort of a headwind, often unfortunately from Washington, yeah. uh, where we, we don't need it. And now maybe it's coming from uh, some other capitals in the world. And uh, you mentioned consumer confidence there. Can, can we rely on consumer confidence as being an indicator that people will actually spend more? They might say they're feeling more confident, but is, is that really a reliable indicator what they'll do when they it's, it's, one, the it's one indicator that sort of uh, that tends to be correlated, but it's correlated with a, a whole bunch of other things. So I wouldn't just say, ah, if, if, if one month you see a, an uptick in consumer confidence, then go out and, and buy because everything is, uh, is, is looking rosy. It's basically one of a set of, uh, of indicators that one would look at for the overall health and, uh, and robustness of the, uh, of the consumer sector. So, Bob, consumer confidence it might be one thing that you look at, but there are other... No, it's not, as you know. I it's mean, not one thing that you look at, uh, <laughs> but, but there are other things, and, and a lot of it has to do with the, the dry powder that consumers have to actually go out and spend. So the credit that they have available, the, the wages that they have available, uh, how many are employed. What, are the, what, is the dry, what does that add up to for the dry powder? Do consumers actually have the ability to spend a little bit more if they feel like spending a little bit more? Uh, I, I think they do, and especially the higher-end consumer, I think, is probably doing a little bit better than the lower-end consumer. The lower-end consumer right now is getting hit uh, from every direction, uh, between the, the food stamps program being cut back uh, rather drastically, the so-called 99-week or the extended unemployment uh, ended cold turkey on, on, at the end of December, uh, and now we've got food prices uh, kind of going through the roof again uh, with the uh, dairy products and uh, now vegetables and fruit in California with all the drought things going on there. And, uh, and now gasoline prices. The, the spring bump came a little bit later, but unfortunately it, it came pretty strong. As we all know, by driving by a gas pump on the way here today, it's uh, certainly back up again. And those are all things that are going to impact the lower end consumer. And, uh, and certainly that end of the market has been pretty hard hit. And I don't know if I see a way out in that market for, for that. On the higher end of the market, I think we're still okay. And I think they can still spend money. The, when you get into the upper uh, quartile of, of consumers, uh, they have a lot of choices. They don't have to buy. And they just need to feel more confident. So this is an interesting question, and it alludes to a broader social issue that we are hearing a lot about, especially in politics, which is income inequality, and some studies suggesting that we're seeing more income inequality than we've ever seen before. And I think one of the issues from an economic perspective is, as you should suggest, if more wealth is held by folks that more of their spending is discretionary on a proportional basis, what does that potentially mean for um, economic growth from the consumer pers perspective? So, uh, Randy, I'd like to ask you what you think about the distribution of income from an economic perspective perspective, what the impact might be if we're seeing more inequality of income? So uh, certainly there's been a stagnation of, um, uh, of, sort of median household uh, income. There are a variety of, of um, statistical factors that may be driving that because households have become smaller over time. And so you might expect less income in a smaller household. So you have to make some adjustments for that. So some of those headline numbers may not be quite as, uh, as bad as they uh, um, they have been portrayed, but still we haven't made the progress that we really would like to see in, uh, in the U.S. And, um, and there has been a particular growth at the upper end. So that's where most of the, the drive and the, uh, the difference is coming from is, is really that the, you know, the, the top part is, uh, is really going, uh, growing much more strongly than uh, many, of the other parts of the, uh, many other parts of the economy. Um, there's a longer-term trend uh, that's, that's here. Actually, there's an excellent uh, new book that just came out called Capital in the 21st Century, making reference to Karl Marx's Capital, which he wrote in the 19th century uh, by Thomas Piketty, where he's put together data looking at these very long-term trends over hundreds of years. And what he argues is that uh, the post-war period, which was sort of a great leveling period, is actually the outlier rather than the, uh, uh, the regular uh, uh, part of the way the economy goes. The book just came out in English. My French is a little bit rusty, so I haven't uh, I haven't gotten through all of it. But I would recommend uh, looking at that because there may be some very interesting data to try to address this issue. And Heidi, when you think globally about uh, consumer spending, do you see that there's some variance in where what we might expect for consumers' ability on the world stage um, 
as far as being, you know, the shift to consumer spending being drivers in other parts of the world as well. Yeah, for sure. I mean, if you think of, we talked about the post-World War II aging of the population and the boomer society, particularly in the U.S. and in Europe and Japan, and even China has an issue with an aging society yes. and aging population from the one-child policy from um, back 30, 40 years ago. But where we are seeing the emergence of the, the middle class and this demographic shift where it's a very young population are, are some of the frontier markets and the truly emerging of the emerging markets. And the opportunity set there for the growth and the demographics there, we think, look outstanding over the longer term. So if we look at some of these smaller um, Asian economies, uh, they're looking very robust. If we look at some of the, the economies in the Middle East as well, in the Gulf, Gulf states, they're looking pretty strong and very robust. And I do think that you see the emergence of the consumer there. Part of the reason why we have an overweight position in the mega caps here in the U.S. marketplace is to take advantage of that consumer in the emerging markets. Um, I think that there there offers some tremendous growth from the consumer and consumer spending there. But again, it's the population and that young population in some of those sectors of the marketplace. So we've alluded to the consumer and we've also alluded to the employment market, which is obviously a big part of how the consumer is feeling. Uh, but I want to do I want to turn the, the conversation to employment and, and its connections to consumer spending. Uh, the employment recovery has really seemed slow across the board, volatile. It seems like we take a couple of steps back yeah. um, for a few steps forward that we take. And, and that part of that could be the noise. Um, but, Bob, Generally speaking, when you look at employment growth and how long it's taken to try to recover the jobs that we lost, why has it been so slow this time around? We just haven't seen breakout employment growth that yeah. we might have liked to see. Yeah, well, I think a big part of it is the construction market hasn't come back. I mean, we lost 9 million jobs in the recession. Two, of the, two million of them directly were construction. That's both residential and, and buildings. Uh, and if you add in probably the mortgage brokers, the lumber companies, the furniture companies, the moving companies, all the assorted landscape companies that go with that, you're probably talking four million of the nine million jobs that were lost were direct, were pretty closely related to the housing industry. Housing's come back. We've gone from 500,000 housing starts uh, to 900,000 housing starts, but we're certainly not back to the 2.2 million that we were at before. And that's one of the reasons the economy is growing slower. And part of that's because of what I believe is overly tight credit in the housing market. The number two thing holding back the economy is government. Uh, government spending has never gone down for so many quarters in a row in any recovery since World War II. Uh, it, it got close in the Vietnam War and it got close after Korea, but we have never seen government be, be such a big negative. We've actually lost 500,000 or more jobs in government since the recovery began. Not since the, since the recovery we began, we've lost 500,000 government jobs. Those are the one, two negatives. But I do think in the next year or two, for those very same demographic reasons we've all been talking about, we come back to this panel next year and certainly by two years from now, we're going to be talking about labor shortages. Okay, well, that, that would be a, a good situation as far as the pressure um, on the em employment market and potentially finding an easier job. But, uh, Randy, I, I want to turn to you and ask you this question, and this is tied to a question that we got from a reader, which mm -hmm. is uh, how closely the employment market is tied to the market recovery. So I think we would traditionally expect that employment would be a lagging indicator, but on the, on the, on the same the other side of the coin, you need a job to be able to spend money. <laughs> so if I don't have a job, how is consumer spending going to improve? So how do you see the connection between uh, unemployment and underemployment and the economic growth prospects. And also an important piece of it is how much people are making when they actually are employed. So right. we've seen very little real wage growth yeah. over the, the recovery. It's basically been roughly at the, the level of inflation. Mm -hmm. And so it's important not only for people to have jobs, but also to have jobs that give them enough money so that they can, uh, they can do more consumption as well as some, uh, some more savings. And so I think that's been a, a key challenge in this recovery, because although maybe there'll be a labor shortage down the line, I, I can only have my fingers crossed for that down the line. I'm not quite as optimistic on, on that. We, we've seen so many people uh, in the labor market that the uh, employers have been very choosy and it's been very competitive uh, for the, uh, the people who want to become employed, so they might be willing to take lower wages than they otherwise would. And so we've seen very low wage growth. This is part of the reason why we're seeing um, in the recovery, even though we haven't had a super robust recovery, uh, corporate profits have been very good because uh, wage costs have been relatively, uh, relatively low. And that's something that's really got to turn around. Part of that, I think, has to do with what John was, uh, was talking about, that we've got this mismatch between uh, the skills of the people who are coming out of the, the construction-related sector and the, the growth sectors in the economy. So a lot of the growth sectors are in tech areas. 
Um, and uh, in the old days, uh, the uh, sort of prime age males with relatively low skills could move back and forth between construction and manufacturing. Today, U.S. manufacturing has nothing to do with the skills that are needed in construction, that sort of strength and uh, hardiness. Now it's all about running a computer program. So, Rainer, you're raising a good point and a big concern that I think people have about structural changes that may mean the employment market in the future is different, not just for mm -hmm. cyclical reasons, but structural reasons. So, Heidi, as we're looking forward and thinking what is a normalized unemployment rate or what does the normalized employment market look like, do we have to set our expectations lower um, and basically say, well, maybe the employment rate will be a little bit higher and there won't be as many jobs available in the future? Well, it's interesting in terms of the way the unemployment rate is calculated, right? If we look at where we were at the end of the year, we were at 7.1. Uh, for unemployment, got down to 6.6, 6.7. You know, the, the Fed originally had a threshold of if we get to 6.5% unemployment, we'll think about stopping this tapering and think about potentially raising interest rates. You know, but they realized that, that having that threshold of just a number is arbitrary, and it doesn't really show what's going on in terms of labor markets in the U.S. marketplace if unemployment is coming down because participation rates are at a 35-year low. Now, if we look at the participation rate, obviously with, with some of the job creation and the mismatch in, in jobs obviously is an issue, but if we think of the participation rate in the 13 million people that have left looking for a job, they've left the employment since 2000, 2007, five and a half million have retired. 2.9 million are disabled. Two and a half million went back to school. And then we've got another 1.4 who'd like a job, but they're not looking for one, right? And so we have this structural issue with participation. And if we look at not only jobs mismatch, not only the retirement and the aging of the population, we do have that subset that has to work longer, so they're not creating jobs on the front end for people to come into it. Um, but if, if we look at the situation with the structural issue, it's, you know, this is sort of a new dynamic for us. And I think unemployment levels are going to be very different than what we, had, what we had seen in the past. And then the advent of technology, not only are jobs being created, if you have some sort of background in technology, but I live in San Francisco. The Golden Gate Bridge is fully fully automatic now. I mean, there's not a single toll booth operator. You think you can take your smartphone and take a picture of a check? You don't even need to go to the bank anymore to deposit the check. With the onset of this technology, it's displacing jobs as well. So I think you might be psychic because I actually just got a question <laughs> from a reader about the the effect of increasing technological progress mm. on unemployment. And Bob, I think I maybe let you off the hook a little bit easy uh, when you mentioned that you think there might be a labor shortage coming up a little bit here. I want to I want to ask you this question because we are seeing some structural differences and potentially some skill mismatch between the kind of jobs that are available and the kind of skills that that workers have. So what do you think if you do think that we'll see shortage where, where will where will they happen and and do you think that that will ultimately sure. be a good thing or will it just be that we don't actually have have the workers where the jobs are available, and we're still going to have a lot of people that can't find jobs. Well, I mean, a lot of things are already, you can see some broad outlines of them. Uh, I work closely with our trucking analyst here at Morningstar, and the average age of a truck driver is like 55 years old. There, there are incredible shortages of truck drivers right now. So that's certainly one area. Uh, airline uh, pilots is another one. The Journal's been writing forever about the retirement in uh, uh, in the pilots now, and that's forcing some shortages there. There's airlines that have had to cancel services to some of their secondary markets because there aren't enough pilots to fly the, fly the planes. That's right now that I'm talking about. That's not the two years when we're getting down to having this meeting again. And uh, in, the, uh, in the oil fields with the stuff happening in North Dakota and Texas, there's no shortage there of jobs. If you want to go out there and drive a truck in, in either of those two states, you can make an income of $100,000 a year. They can't get enough people to move to North Dakota and, and South Texas right now. Well, that might have something to do with the housing market as well. I can't sell or I can't move right now. Okay, so some very Unfortunately, tents don't count in the, uh, in the housing <laughs> starts. So very interesting dynamics in the employment market, and I think we could talk about it the whole hour. But I want to move along now to another big player in the room, and that's the Federal Reserve. And Randy, of course, I'm going to start with you here with the All Federal right. Reserve. Uh, of course, we have seen extraordinary measures taken by the Federal Reserve since 2008, and probably no one knows more about some of the intricate inside workings of those measures than you do having been there at the time. So talk to me a little bit about the exit from these measures. And the taper has been a big issue. And in, sure. in last year, the taper was an issue. Just talking about the taper caused issues in the market. Now the Fed seems determined to continue with this tapering program. Is it going to stay the course? And more importantly, will it be successful in, in getting the stimulus removed? Sure. So remember, the taper is just about reducing the pace 
of additional purchases. So it's not actually a contraction. I think some people are a little bit confused about that. It's just reducing the pace of increase. And so they had been buying $85 billion a month, and now uh, the projection is down to $55 billion. That's additional uh, liquidity that's being put into uh, the marketplace. So I think it's important to get that, that definition uh, out first. So it's not a contraction, it's just uh, a slowing of the, uh, the addition that's being put in. But obviously that's caused a lot of uh, tremors in the, in the markets, both in the U.S. Uh, fixed income market as well as in, uh, in emerging markets around the world. And I think the, uh, the Fed is on course to continue to do this as long as the economy doesn't go too far out of, uh, out of its forecast range. The forecast range, I think, is basically the kind of range that uh, we've been talking about. They're thinking about uh, 2 to 3% growth um, as th their broad, broad range, uh, inflation staying relatively low. We have inflation significantly below the target level that, uh, that they, uh, they have. If it gets too low and starts to get towards a sort of a Japanese style or a 1930s deflation, they'll stop this and they'll start buying more. Uh, more. I don't see that happening, but I also don't see any big inflation pressure coming that's going to lead them to have to uh, have to pull back. But these are the uncertainties that we have. We've never been in a situation like this before. Um, all the models and all the commitment from the FOMC members five years ago when I was there as well as today is to make it as smooth as possible. Will it be smooth? I can almost guarantee you there will be bumps along the way because we haven't done this before. Um, but I think the Fed has a strong commitment to respond if there is some, something that gets a little bit out of alignment to try to respond to that. We saw that um, uh, last year in May and June when uh, the taper talk started some tantrums in economies. Um, the chairman talked that back a bit and tried to smooth things out. And now we see that the 10-year the rate is not too far from where it was back a year ago. And, uh, and so um, I think they've been able to make it make smooth out something that's a very difficult exit, but you're going to see some volatility in between. There's no, no way of getting around it. Sorry, you mentioned there that the, the tapering is actually just easing up on the gas a little bit. It's not actually it's taking up, the, up, applying the, the brake. Exactly. It's just a little bit off of the accelerator, but no brake yet. But, but uh, Janet Yellen did say that it's conceivable that after they're have, have, they're finished with the tapering, sure. but rates could rise up to six months after that. So that, that is pu putting on the brakes. And what, what do you think would cause them to stray from that? And do, do you think that this is something that should be on market's radar at, at this point? It seemed to be, but then sure. markets seem to say, well, maybe they won't do it. <laughs> well, I think there's a little bit of an overreaction because what um, uh, Richard Yellen said was not too far from when where market expectations were to begin with. But then I think when um, she was a bit more specific about what a considerable period would mean, that it would be perhaps six months <laughs> after the, uh, the wind down, that, that seemed to, to get people a little bit uh, uh, upset. But by the next day, I think it was forgotten because if you look back to where the expectations were the previous day, it was sort of six to nine months anyway. And so uh, when you're talking out a year, year and a half, um, the rough estimate, if you can get things roughly right within a quarter, you're doing, uh, doing pretty well. So I think they've, uh, uh, the, the market's reacted a little more strongly than they should have. And one, and one more question while I'm with you, based on what you'd said. Now, you said that you're not seeing the inflationary pressures, which would crimp the Fed's ability to, right. to be responsive. Why is that? I mean, we have seen extraordinary stimulus measures. We've seen extraordinary bond buying. We've seen a lot of liquidity coming sure. in. So why, where's the inflation? What, what hasn't happened? I mean, what's extraordinary is that the Fed's balance sheet uh, went from about $800 billion now to more than $4 trillion. In normal circumstances, this means duck and cover. This means inflation is coming and you have to worry. But as you can see, over the last five years, we've had low inflation, not high inflation. And the difference is that um, what the Fed is doing in responding uh, by buying, these, uh, buying the bonds and expanding their balance sheet is they're providing more short-term safe liquid assets in the system. That's what people want. And so when there's a very strong demand for those, if the Fed didn't respond, we would get severe deflation like they, get, uh, they had in Japan and like, well, that wasn't severe, the ongoing deflation, and like we had in the 1930s in the U.S. Because people wanted short-term safe liquid assets. There wasn't any place to go, and so they weren't spending. They were, uh, they were hoarding things. Prices then, uh, then fell. And um, by the Fed responding like this, we've avoided the deflation. And, uh, and hopefully what they will be able to do is 
as confidence is restored, people are willing to invest and spend in other areas, take more risks, that they'll be able to, to pull back in a way that will prevent inflation from coming. I think there's a very strong uh, commitment by the FOMC to do that. And if you look at both market, um, uh, market-based measures of inflation expectation as well as survey-based measures, they seem to be pretty successful. If you look even five or 10 years out, inflation expectations are pretty well contained. And, and I think it's really held things back too. Uh, that you can't get a, easily get a loan for a mortgage. The FICO score on an approved mortgage today is not much different than it was in 2009. You know, and it's about 50 points higher than it was uh, at the beginning of the, of the recession. So we have really tightened down on credit. So they're putting all the punch bowl out there, but they're putting a ring around it and not letting anybody get to the punch bowl, so to speak. And businesses, we've talked about very low revenue growth. We've talked about that, gee, they've had low labor costs, but they've also and cut costs, but they haven't gotten much revenue growth because of the poor uh, growth in incomes. And so that's created a problem where they don't need working capital loans as much as they used to. They don't need these giant expansion loans to put in new plants. So there's also been less demand for all that money that's sitting out there. And certainly the Congressional Budget Office output gap shows we still, uh, uh, four or five years into this recovery, have this big gap between what the economy could produce and what we're actually producing. And until that gets closer, it's uh, doubtful other than maybe a little commodity-based inflation, which we may see in the next six months, uh, inflation should be under good control. Heidi, I want to talk about the intersection between the Fed and the stock market. So I think there are a couple of angles here. Um, one reader was asking about the low interest rate policy and how that's affected the stock market. The first thing is I think people feel as if the Fed's activities have really bolstered the stock market and a lot of uh, the, the growth that we've seen is just underpinned by this artificial involvement of the Fed in the economy. Um, and when the Fed starts to remove that, we'll see a big collapse in the stock market because mm -hmm. the fundamentals aren't there. But then I also think people are worried about um, interest rates going up overall and what does that mean for the different parts of their portfolio. So how does the Fed factor into your market outlook and your market recommendations from BlackRock's point of view? Sure. Um, so there was a couple of questions in there. Um, I'll, I'll address the, the interest rate scenario first. I think when we take a look at what we're seeing with the Fed and raising interest rates, if we look at the 10-year, uh, by way of example, and, and, J and um, I'm sorry, Randy made a great point talking about just the talk of tapering last year, sending you know, 10-year was at 1.86, went up, close the year at 303. We're back down to about 275 today because people didn't understand what tapering was. What is tapering? They think it's tightening, right? And so we spent so much time last year just talking to our clients, helping them understand that we're still adding money to the system. We're still doing quantitative easing. We're just doing less of it. And if we're doing less of it, it's because the economy is showing signs of improvement. It's a good thing that we don't need the stimulus, right? And so so I think we, we spent a lot of time just trying to help them understand what is tapering. Tapering will eventually stop, we'll pause, and then somewhere down the line, we'll raise interest rates. So that's on the Fed funds rate, right? That's on the, the short end of the curve, what the Fed can control in terms of raising interest rates. So we don't think that's going to happen until sometime into 2015 that the Fed's actually going to raise interest rates. And that's a forward guidance that that they've been giving us. Um, so from, you know, the bad news is for all the all the people dialed in today, they're, the money that they're making in their banks isn't going to be much more in their savings accounts, right? So with that, you're almost forced to go elsewhere, right, and take on additional risks to try to get it. So that's helped drive some of the returns that we've seen in the equity markets. We saw what happened when we talked about tapering and pulling pulling up the easy money and easy monetary policy and the implications on emerging markets, right? And so the dry up there because people were just afraid that now there's not going to have this this easy money, the liquidity is going to dry up. And we saw the volatility in the in the emerging markets. I think most of that is is close to being done, if not pretty darn close to coming to some sort of bottom in the in the emerging market equities in particular. In the U.S. marketplace, though, when we looked at that volatility with the 10-year, once we ripped the Band-Aid off and we started quantitative easing and we went from 85 to now 55, you know, 85 to 75 to 65 and now 55 in terms of the report of repurchasing of mortgage backs and treasuries, we've seen since the end of the year the 10-year the trade in this sort of 270, 280 range, right? Not a lot of volatility because the tapering is now priced into it. I think if we look at the advance of the 10-year between now and, say, the end of the year or 12 months out, it's a, at the end of the year, 50 basis point change in 10-year, 
12 months out, maybe 75 basis points. So looking at a 10-year coming in at 325, 350 over the next sort of, you know, say, 9 to 12 months um, in the marketplace. Nothing that's going to be too disruptive to what we're seeing in the housing market recovery and those types of things. Um, if we look at what's happened, yes, it's, it's helped to propel some of the equity markets because you're forced to essentially look to other places for returns. So if you're getting zero interest rate in your bank, you're stepping up into some of the equity-like fixed income investment. You're buying bank loans, you're buying high yield, you're buying some emerging market debt, you're getting dividend-paying stocks, you're buying MLPs, you're buying preferred, you're buying REITs, you're buying these other income-producing things because you need income for retirement and to survive. So sure, that was there, but if we, if we stop tapering and eventually raise interest rates, I don't see a huge pullback. In the, in the U.S. marketplace by, by any means. And it was interesting when we just talked about inflation and looking at the implications of inflation. You know, it's all about the velocity of money, right? And so we hadn't seen banks lend, as, as Bob was mentioning. But we start in the latest Fed survey, there's actually been a pickup in lending now. And so that translates into inflation down the road over the next two to three years if we see that continuations of banks actually starting to lend again. So we talk about monetary policy. Let's turn a little bit and talk about fiscal policy and what's going on in Washington. Randy, I think you'd mentioned earlier that it's been unnecessary hindrance for us over the last few years. Bob, I know that you've been looking at uh, fiscal policy and the sequester and the effects that it's had on the economy. So what might we expect um, from the government's um, fiscal policy and how it might impact the economy going forward? Are we through a lot of the, the, the worst of what we'd seen? I think we're through the worst of it. And, and uh, Ben Bernanke said a couple of times, citing a SIBO Congressional Budget Office uh, document that maybe we took a percent to a percent and a half off of the economy because of all the fiscal things that have happened over the last uh, uh, 12 to 18 months. And that includes uh, the sequester, the increase in the payroll tax, the uh, increase in some of the income taxes, some of the special uh, uh, Affordable Care Act taxes, all kind of came in in one fell swoop. And those things all held back the growth of the economy. And I don't know that I agree that it was a whole percent to a percent and a half, but it certainly held it back. So for all kind of here sitting here talking about 2%, a lot of people are kind of going, oh, well, we take the 2% and you add a 1% back for government and we're at 3%. Uh, I think that's probably a little bit optimistic, but certainly government uh, has been holding back the economy. And I don't think it's going to come back as fast as people think. I think some of the war spending is permanently wound down. I think some of the procurement items aren't, aren't going to ramp up the way some people think they are. And then you've got the state and local government, which I don't think will do really well either, because so much of their growth was driven by more real estate, more sewage plants, more roads to faraway suburbs. And uh, this time, the move seems to be back into the cities. Where some of the big developments are coming closer to the inner core again, which doesn't require any more infrastructure. So I don't think we're going to see a big spurt in government, but I think it is going to be a less, less of a drag than last year. I mean, it's hard to argue with that. The deficit went from $1.1 trillion uh, to just under $600 billion in one year. That's the biggest fall that that number has ever had. And Bob was talking about some of the spending that the government decided not to do as part of the, the fiscal policy wrangling that they had. But coming up in the future, about 10 or 15 years, there's going to be a lot of spending that the government needs to do on certain social programs, especially sure. Medicare and, and health care programs. So we're looking a little bit beyond the savings that they're having right now through some of the cuts. What's the fiscal situation going to look like, Randy, when we get to some of these big um, programs that are going to cost a lot of money? The government won't have a lot of money to spend on other things then. We still haven't dealt with these issues. So the long Long term is still quite dicey. I really think that um, it's an unsustainable situation because we have to deal with the longer term health care costs. We have to deal with the, the aging of the population that's going to affect that. We have to deal with Social Security. And so we haven't. We've been able to paper over things in the short run, so at least we're not sort of on the edge, ready to fall off to, um, you know, to start uh, have people questioning whether we're going to pay our debt or not. That was sort of a silly exercise that didn't uh, didn't really help to uh, to generate a lot of confidence and have us move forward. But we still haven't dealt with these fundamentals. I very much agree that in the short run. We have much better, um, uh, better looking fiscal uh, fiscal situation, and actually a number of states have, have done quite well. Like California has moved from being in a significant deficit to a surplus. Unfortunately, Illinois, where I am, uh, we're still in deficit, and looks like that is going to be there as far as the eye can see. So some states have been able to turn around, and and I think that's been important. Other states haven't been able to, but. We've got these longer run issues like Illinois with the pension fund issues. We've got the longer run issues for the uh, for the federal uh, 
situation, and we just haven't dealt with those. We've got to deal with those, because otherwise we're going to be back at this in a few years. And I, have a, I would like to follow up, because you mentioned some of the deficit issues. A reader is asking about the debt levels of uh, the United States government, and will that be a problem for the economy in those future years when we do have to do more of that spending, on, especially on some of these social programs? It certainly gives you less, um, less breathing space. Certainly if you have, uh, just like if you'd come into the financial crisis with very low uh, uh, debt levels, there are a lot of good opportunities for taking advantage of things uh, to, because a lot of asset prices were depressed. But if you had very high debt levels, you were very leveraged, you couldn't take advantage of those. And so the same thing going forward when we've got these expenditures that are coming up, it's going to be much more difficult as trade trade-offs are much tougher when you don't have that same kind of breathing space. And unfortunately, we don't. And there's other issues with the debt, too, because it's going to go from a relatively small percentage of GDP to a high percentage just as we move back from these record low interest rates that we've been at to kind of the late rates that we were talking about. If they start having to pay 4 or 5 percent on the 10-year bond a few years out and we continue to run a deficit, this deficit begins to snowball. And uh, the interest payments on it, likewise. And the increase in the interest rates is almost a bigger problem than the health care in the out years of the program, unless we solve some of these problems now. All right, so I was worried this was going to happen to us. Uh, the time has flown by, and I didn't quite get to all the questions that I wanted to get to on my list. But I do have a bonus question for the three of you. Um, I want to get your take uh, for each of you on what do you think is the biggest point of optimism for the economy right now, and what's the biggest worry spot? What's the thing that keeps you up at night about the economy, the biggest unanswered questions? How do you, uh, let's start with you. Most optimistic and most uh, worrisome part of the economy right now? Sure. I'd say the most optimistic is, is probably this energy revolution and becoming much more self-sustained in terms of energy. It has implications on geopolitical risks and relations there. And I think with the infrastructure and the jobs that can be created, we mentioned North Dakotans and some of these um, areas in Texas as well. I think that that could be a real positive for the U.S. marketplace. Um, in fact, we have an overweight position on energy right now, particularly because of some of the infrastructure uh, as well. But I think that could be that could be just a really, a really big thing for us moving forward over the next three to five years. In terms of uh, the biggest concern, I'd say wage growth and employment is is a big concern and the implication for the um, the consumer and you know this income inequality it's you know it's real if we think about the U.S. market stock market if you had money to invest was up 30 percent if you owned your home nationwide house prices were up 10 percent if you didn't have the benefit of having either one of those you're still flat right or or less if wages aren't outpacing inflation so I think that issue is something that that worries us and then of course the unknown unknowns right if there's any sort of geopolitical tensions and and anything that could be potentially attacking on U.S. soil is, is, of course, something that's always looming in the background. Randy? So on the negative side, I think the point that we were talking about, about the, the long-term fiscal situation in the U.S., we're just not facing these issues. We have to face these issues, and um, they are going to continue to be a drag on us because we have to deal with that, um, and that will continue to have uncertainty for both for individual consumers as well as for uh, for corporations because they won't know what the structure and level of taxes are going to look like to deal with this. And so I think that's uh, that's an uncertainty that uh, that really ne needs to be dealt with. On the positive side, um, I agree on the uh, the energy piece is something that's uh, very good for uh, for the U.S. and uh, and I think that. Uh, uh, that's one piece of it. And in the short run, I think uh, the strength of the corporate balance sheets mm -hmm. is something that is, uh, is very important. We've seen some improvement in household balance sheets. There's still a lot more way to go. But uh, corporate balance sheets are in a very good position. And so if we can turn the corner, deal with some of these uncertainty issues, and we've mentioned a lot of them, get both corporations and individuals to be more optimistic. We'll see more people come into the labor market. We will see more production. We will see more wage growth. And we can come back. But we've got these uh, uh, clouds that are out there. The crystal ball is cloudy. Yeah, corporations have gotten lean and mean, and they've gotten a lot of cash. So it's a matter of being able to try to deploy some of that out. Right. They the can economy. do it fairly quickly, but they need to have the reason to do it. And when you have these, these clouds of uh, fiscal and other uncertainties out there, uh, they're unlikely to, to move ahead with lightning speed. Bob. Yeah, I think this is going to be a, uh, uh, continue to be a slow but longer recovery. What we lack in robustness is recovery. We, we may get back in longevity. And I think the housing market is going to be the key driver of that. Housing still remains about 3% of GDP right now. That number got as high as 7%, and the average is right around 5 So housing has got a lot of runway room yet in front of it. We may have some short-term issues, 
but I think housing is going to be a key driver, and I think the key to that market is going to be looser lending standards, just as you say. So I think that's potentially the biggest uh, positive. And I'll turn the negative, uh, take the positive and turn it into the negative. I, I think we're <laughs> one uh, shale train uh, accident here in Chicago that kills thousands of people that upsets the whole uh, oil shale revolution um, here in the United States. We're about the only country that's really letting this go in such a robust manner. Even countries like uh, Poland uh, are, are not saying, you know what, maybe we need to be a little careful about this shale thing. And maybe, maybe it's a leakage from out of one of these uh, shale things, or maybe it's a train crash. I hope that we don't get one of those situations. I really do. Mm -hmm. uh, but really, that's one of the things I, that keeps me up awake at night. I mean, if that accident in Canada had happened with that multi-car train, with that explosive fuel uh, in a Chicago rail yard, uh, it would have been a whole different situation. I could sit here and talk to you guys all day. This has been a great conversation. Thanks so much for joining me for your insights. Heidi Richardson, Randy Krosner, and Bob Johnson. It was great to speak with you today and to get all of your input on the economy. Thanks, Jason. Thank you.